When a person's angry with God, I've often seen their lives spiral downward to the point where they don't recover. Well, today on Day Renewal, I'm going to share some things with you that will help you get through those times where you may feel that you are mad at God. things that I think is common, uh, you know, as I talk to a lot of people, is at certain times of our life, you know, a lot of people have gone through situations where they find themselves angry at God. Well, this week, I uh, had something very interesting happen. I was uh, just finished a Bible study with somebody, and uh, I was going to a local health food store, and I was getting out of my vehicle when uh, the person beside me was somebody that I recognized that I hadn't seen in a long time. And uh, so, just like uh, any normal situation, I come up to the vehicle, and I ask this person, Oh, how are you doing? And he proceeded to tell me about a situation involving his son, and to make a long story short, his son was killed in a hunting accident. And uh, this had just happened, maybe about a month ago, and, you know, one of the things that he mentioned is that, you know, through all of this, he was angry at God. Now, as I relay that situation, it can be very awkward because, you know, as, uh, you know, as I'm standing here and I hadn't seen this man for quite a while, and when this story came out, you know, you know what do you say to somebody who has had a circumstance like this happen? Well, immediately, you know, my first response was, you know, I'm really sorry for what happened and, uh, and, and, you know, if there's anything that I can help with, I would gladly do that. But as I began to think about it, you know, what I'd really like to do in a situation like that is, is actually help someone. You know, have some solid advice for somebody going through those situations. Now, as I prepared this video, one of the things that I also thought about was the fact that, uh, that the things that I'm about to talk to you about today are not something that would have been the right timing, I don't believe, uh, to be able to share with this person, because let's face it, when somebody is in a situation similar to this, where maybe they are very angry at God and the circumstances has really encompassed everything around them to the point where really they're probably not looking for advice at this time, my thought behind this video is uh, for us to be able to, when somebody maybe is in a situation where they're angry at God, this will be some things that will maybe, maybe when the timing is right, uh, you'll be able to use to help somebody. And not only that, uh, the other thing that I think that this video will be good for is if you are yourself in a position where maybe you don't feel like talking to anybody about it, but you do want to take some active steps because you know that this idea about being angry with God, that that's something that you can't continue to do. You just know that it's not right, but you don't know how to handle it. So it's with that today that we'll get into our video. Uh, I'm Pastor Lyle, and welcome to Daily Renewal. If this is your first time tuning in with us, I just want to invite you to uh, consider becoming a subscriber to our channel. Also, if you're getting benefit out of our content, please like and share this video with anybody that you think that it will help. Well, as I've thought about this topic, uh, probably one of the best places to start in the Bible when we talk about going through uh, you know, some really tough stuff where if anybody had uh, what, what a lot of people would consider a right to be mad at God, when let's say right off the bat that none of us have a real right to be mad at God, but God does understand that we have emotions and feelings. But if there is, is anything, anybody that probably exemplifies going through tough stuff, it was Job. And we find uh, Job in the Old Testament, and when we start out uh, in the book of Job, we have to understand that uh, Job was a guy that was upright in the eyes of God. In Job 1, starting in verse 1, it says, There was, where it was a man in the land of Uz, or Uz, who was na uh, was, his name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters born to him. Uh, also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, uh, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, a very large household, so uh, that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons would go 
and feast in their houses each uh, on his appointed day and, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed, uh, cursed God in their hearts. Thus, Job did regularly. So here's a guy who is doing well. He's, he's one of the greatest men of his time. Uh, he's got uh, riches. He's got a family. Uh, notoriety. You know, everything seems to be going well. And then all of a sudden, if you continue reading this on your own for the sake of time, you'll find out that Satan takes a look at this man Job and basically confronts Job, uh, confronts God about Job and says, you know what, the reason why Job likes you so much is because nothing happens to him that's bad. And so God gives him permission to do a certain, to, you know, allows a certain amount to be done to prove to Satan that Job uh, really does, uh, really is a man of God. And so as you go down through, uh, through this particular story, you'll find out that, that what happens is Job loses his ten children. They all die in accidents. Uh, his, and we can see that in Job, uh, Job 119. In Job 27, you'll see that his health is affected. You know, Satan affects his health. And also in Job 1:14 uh, to 17, you can also see that all of his wealth, his cattle, all these things, his wealth is taken away. So we see that these three things, which a lot of people consider some of the most important things in life, uh, you know, that can be questioned. But for a lot of people, you know, the idea of our family, you're know, losing children, uh, our health going downhill, and losing all of our wealth, our possessions, whether it be our job, anything like this. He had all three of these things absolutely decimated to the point where people were actually making fun of him. And, you know, so it's with that that I want to take a look at how Job handled some of these situations. Because he handled them, even though he didn't handle them necessarily perfectly, this is a guy that understood that he needed to have a focus on God. And so the first thing that I want to talk to talk to you about today that I think that we need to have our focus when we're going through these things. You know, when I think about my friend who lost his son, that's very tragic. Um, you know, and, and, and when things like that happen, as we mentioned earlier, you can get mad at God. And, you know, just like when we get mad at people, we have to be very careful that when we get mad at God, the last thing we should do is cut off communication. And so the first thing that I want to challenge you with, if you're in a situation where you feel like you're mad at God, is this is a time where you need to make the effort to communicate with Him. And we see this with Job in uh, Job 28, 3 and 4. Job, Job's talking here and he says, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his, his seat. I would present my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in his great power? So Job here is saying, you know what? I want to have a conversation with God. And, you know, I found in times where you know, in situations in my life, I've had a few times where as much as I love God, I didn't understand why some things were happening. And there was times where I have to admit, I said, you know, I, that I was mad at God. But that being the case, the, uh, the thing that I found is this. When you're in a situation like that, as, I, as I've alluded to, this is the time where we don't want to ignore God. Where we don't want to try to distance ourselves. You know, the fact that we are angry... You know, don't feel bad about bringing your, those angry thoughts, those emotions to God. You wouldn't be the first, my friend, and you won't be the last. You can see all through the Old Testament. There was times where Moses was upset with God and he confronted him. You know, we see, uh, you know, Jeremiah, you know, you know, David. There was times where all of these great men and women of God, you know, had times where they were angry because they just didn't understand. And you know what? God's got big shoulders. He understands that we're emotional people. But the, the thing that he really wants us to understand is that when we have these kind of emotions stirring in us, he wants us to come to him. 
You know, if it's anybody that understands, uh, you know, missed expectations by other people, it would be him. Take a look at us, for example. You, you know, there isn't any of us that have met God's requirements perfectly. You know, it, it, you know, and so now, you know, then he had to send Jesus just so we could be reconciled. You know, so, so God understands what it's like to have his expectations not met by other people. You know, and it's with that, you know, we have to understand that when these things happen, is you know, God says to us, you know, He wants us to come to Him, and you know, you can read this, for example, in First Peter, First Peter five. Um, God, or Paul is, or, or Peter, or God is talking through Peter here, and he starts off by talking about the idea of of submitting to God. And he uses the example, he starts out in verse 5, he says, you know, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to elders. Uh, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Now, from there, he begins to talk about the importance of humility. Now, the, before I get into this, I'll tell you why this is important. Is because any time we ever get to the place where we're mad at God, it's because we feel like God has not met our expectations. I even recently heard a Christian leader say that, or somebody that was formerly involved with Christian leadership, he says, you know, after thinking about all this, there was times where I just feel like, you know what, I think I could have made better decisions than God. Now, anybody that thinks that way, that's a real indication of pride and not having a clue, having a clue about what's really going on here. But it's with that that I, I, I want to just set the tone in saying that the idea of being humble is really important, especially if you're angry with God. You know, remember, we do not know near as much ab uh, about what's going on. We serve a God that is, that is omniscient. And that word omniscient means that he's all-knowing. You know, there's things that we don't know uh, that went on before us that are going on now and that will go on uh, you know, from the, in the time to come. God makes the best decisions that could possibly be made. And we only see a partial picture of what's going on. And if you look at it in hindsight, there's a lot of things that, that once you did get better information, you probably would have done things different. But having said that, let, let's carry on. He says this, in ver at the end of verse 5, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. So we see here, the key is to remain humble. Even when you don't understand what's going on, humble yourself before the Lord. And it says this, casting all of your care... And another translation of that, uh, it says, uh, casting all your anxiety. So casting all your care, your anxiety, your problems. In this case, you can see, say, the things that make you angry. Cast those things upon him, upon the Lord, for he cares for you. The first thing you have to understand, friend, is no matter what circumstance came, has come your way that has caused you to be angry, know this, that God does care for you. You know, even when it doesn't feel like it, even when you're questioning that, be, be sure of this and know this. His word is true and his word says that God cares for you. And not only that, he cares for you enough that he wants you to come to him again and cast your anxiety, cast your cares, cast the things that have caused you to become angry upon him. And then it says this, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It says, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So this is, is solving another potential question you may be having, and it's this. I've heard many people say, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, first of all, None of us are good in the eyes of God. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God, you know, still in his mercy chose to, to show his love for us by sending Jesus so that anybody who would call upon Jesus' name could be reconciled to him. That being said, understand that just like Job, the same enemy that tried to destroy Job is the same enemy that's being talked about here that is trying to orchestrate things in your life to try and sidetrack you in you uh, in your relationship with God. And for whatever reason, 
God has allowed certain things to happen. But make no mistake about it. It's not God that is trying to destroy your life. It's an enemy, Satan, uh, who, who is eagerly looking to sidetrack everything that is established or that's been established in your walk with God. But, but here's the thing we need to keep in mind when we look at verse 10. It says, but may the God of all grace, and that word grace is the unmerited favor of God. It's nothing that we can earn, and I talk about this often. It's also, grace is the power of God that enables you to do what you cannot do in your own strength. It's the power of God that, that strengthens you, that gets you through, that it's something that you, you cannot manufacture. Only God, and He gives that to us. So it says, by the God of all grace, who called us to His er eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, I want to focus on this next, next point, and, and this is the next point that we have to see. So we see here, we have to understand that uh, you know, God wants you to come to him. First of all, he wants you to come to him when you're angry. And, and just talk to him. Explain to him. Pour your feelings out to him. Bring your cares to him. But the second thing that we have to understand is that we need to learn to embrace suffering. And uh, I had a really interesting con uh, conversation with uh, another pastor friend of mine. And uh, he's going through some real, uh, real uh, adversity right now. He's dealing with, um, with uh, thyroid cancer. Uh, he also uh, he was dealing with some heart problems. He's liver transplant. He has gone through some suffering. And let me tell you, friend, it was funny because I hadn't seen him in a few years. And he saw me and he ran up to me and he reminded me this one time where he was going through things. And he said, you know, you prayed for me. And it was such an encouragement. But he also talked about the fact that, you know what? I believe that God heals, but I also believe that a lot of the things that I'm going through, some of the suffering I'm going through, I've learned so much through it. And it's, you know, with a testimony like that, that I think that w I, I want to just share with you so that we can uh, come to a, a little bit greater understanding that there is benefits in suffering. And, you know, so, so Jesus, or uh, God, God uses Peter here to write this. And he says, as I mentioned earlier, he says, after we have suffered a while, there's some things that happen. So if we learn to embrace suffering, here's some of the things that God will use suffering for. He says, uh, it will perfect us, it will establish us, it will strengthen us, and it will settle us. And you know, it's God's desire for these things to, to happen in our lives. You know, the idea of being perfected uh, in, in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, this is a work that only God can do. We can never be perfect in the, in the eyes of God in our own strength. But God is, is desiring to perfect our relationship with Him. And also establish us so that we're not, you know, not blown to and fro. You know, I, there's often times where I think, you know, we can see, especially if you're new in the faith, you know, you can be affected by things to the point where, you know, it's like a, like your Christian walk is like a roller coaster ride. You're up and down and up and down. Well, you know, as God establishes our walk uh, with Him, you'll see that this is something that it, this idea of being established, it means that there's less highs and lows that go on in our walk because the, the trust in Him is being established. And then, of course, the strengthening. You know, we, we learn to not lean on our own strength, but lean on His. And then, of course, ending with settling us. You know, the idea of, of just being able to walk, knowing that no matter what happens, God is in control. You know, and, and if we look back at, at the book of Job, well, we see that Job, actually, uh, he really did embrace suffering. Uh, in, when we look at Job 13, uh, for example, uh, in Job 13, uh, in verse 15, this is one of the famous things that Job said. As he's going through all these things, he, he says this about God. He says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. And if we skip down uh, to verse 20, listen to what Job says. He says, only to, he says to God, he says, Only two things do not do to me. Then I will not hide myself from you. Withdraw your hand from me, and let not the dread of you make me afraid. 
And so you see here that what Job is saying, he says, I'll stick with you, but there's only two things that I ask you won't do. And, and those two things really are, he's saying, Lord, I just don't want you to leave me. And I don't want to get to the point where I'm fearful of you in, in, a, in, a, a, uh, in a way that, um, that I have dread of you, you know, because I've done wrong. And so, you know, we see here that Job, he was somebody that, in, that embraced suffering. May not have understand what, uh, or understood what, what was going on, but he did understand that he needed to embrace it. And, uh, you know, we see even with Jesus, if we look at uh, the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 5 and, and verses 8 and 9 says this, and this is talking about Jesus. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. Now, at first glance, you might think, well, what do you mean Jesus learned obedience? You know, Jesus, wasn't, wasn't he all-knowing? Like, Jesus was the Son of God? I mean, you know, wasn't he obedient right from the beginning? Well, you know, Jesus might have known the difference between right and wrong, and he might have been sinless, but there's obviously something here that had to happen even with Jesus to set the example of the of what obedience, uh, what obedience really really meant. Now I'll give you an example. You know, if somebody was to, uh, for example, if, if you look at somebody that is a driver. You know, I don't know what it's like now, but when I was a kid, they had you could get your learner's license. You know, you read the you get the booklet, you read the booklet, and as soon as you get the booklet, they write you off, and you can go drive with somebody else, and they can teach you. Or whatever, but you know, if you got your learner's license, you didn't even have to have driven at any point. You just had to write the test. Now, if you were to get on YouTube and look at all the driving videos that you want, and and you could talk to 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 uh, multiple drivers, you could have driving mentors, and and you could li read the 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 book uh, the manual on how to drive. You could do all of that. Have the book memorized. Watch thousands of hours of YouTube. But how many know you could know how to drive, you know, through through all of these these means. You could know exactly all the ins and outs of driving, but none of those things mean that you're a driver until you actually get in the car, turn on the ignition, put it into drive, start moving, and buckle up your seatbelt, of course. But you know, it, it, you aren't a driver until you actually begin to drive. You can know everything about driving, but until you turn the key and, and put it into drive, you're not actually a driver. And for Jesus, even though he knew all right and wrong, you know, he knew exactly what, what, what God required. Until it was tested, until he could put it into practice, uh, he wasn't going, it wasn't going to be looked at as being obedient. And so for Jesus, the idea of learning obedience by the things that he suffered, the suffering was putting the things that he knew to the test so that it became a part of who he was. And see, for us, when we look at the idea of the tests that we go through, these are, uh, these are the things that, that show us if we really do believe what we believe. You know, we might know different things, but again, just knowing them without them becoming a part of us, you know, without them being tested, you, you know, we find out just like Peter found out, you know, we've talked about this often in Daily Renewal, the night that Peter betrayed Jesus, he said, oh, no, you know, I'm not going to betray you, everybody else might betray you, but I won't betray you, and we found out that when that was put to the test, Peter found out that he was nowhere near where he thought he was. And, and it was through a lot of the emotional suffering and different things that he went through so that he was able to be restored. It was through those testing, testings, through those sufferings that he went through, that God was able to do a work in his life so that he would be someone who was truly obedient to Christ. Now, uh, that brings me to my third and final point today, so we've talked about the fact that you know, if you feel like you're mad at God, we need to go to Him, we need to talk to Him about it, bring your cares to Him. Second one, we need to have a mindset of embracing suffering because when we embrace suffering, there's a work that is done in our life. Uh, but that being the case, the third one today I want to talk about is the fact that we have to trust 
that God is doing a work in our life even when we don't see it. Uh, and actually, I'm going to give you a fourth point after that too. But uh, the, the, the fact that God's, God's doing things in our life, and, and we see that Job understood that. Uh, when we look at Job 23, for example, verses 9 and 10, we see here that Job says this. He says, when he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way that I take, and when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. You know, when Job is going through all this, and again, we see this idea of Job even embracing the test. Job not only embraced the test, but he understood that, that whatever he's going through right now, even though it doesn't make any sense to him, he knew that God would bring him forth, as it were, as gold. You know, so for you, my friend, you know, as you're going through these things, understand, God sees the beginning and the end. He loves you enough that he is doing everything he can to bring you forth as gold, no matter what it looks like. You know, don't understand it, but understand this. God is bringing me through like gold. And that brings me to the last one. I, I'm going to give a fourth point because actually this is probably the most important point of them all. And we see this when we uh, skip over to, um, to the last chapter of Job. We have to remember that God is powerful. And you know what? God has the ability to take an absolutely horrific situation and bring healing to your life. God doesn't just want you to suffer and die in that suffering. No, with everything, God has a destination. And God is powerful enough to restore. Now, did, did, uh, did Job get all of his kids back, the original kids back that died? No. But let's, I want to show you what God did. Starting in verse 10 of verse 40, uh, chapter 42 of the book of Job, it says, And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord uh, gave Job twice as much as he had before. And remember, he had lots before. Then all his brothers and all his sisters and all those who had been his acquaintances before came to him and ate food with him in his house, and they consoled him and comforted him. Uh, for uh, for all the adversity that jo or that the Lord had brought upon him, each one gave him a piece of silver and each a ring of gold. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, for he had for, uh, 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters, and he called the name of the first Jemima, and the name of the second, Keziah, and the name of the third, Karen, uh, Karen Hapuk. Uh, in all the land were found no women so beautiful as the daughters of Job, and uh, their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw the children and grandchildren for four generations. So Job died old and full of days." Remember, my friend, that no matter how bad it is now, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And you know, one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 23, talks about you know, the fact that the Lord will lead us through the valley of the shadow of death. Notice it doesn't say the Lord leads us to the valley just so that we can sit there and camp out, have a terrible life, and end in absolute misery. No, it says he leads us through the valley of the shadow of death. Right now, if you're going through situations where you're just, none of this is making sense, you feel angry about it, you don't know how to deal with it, the thing that you have to understand is that God knows your beginning and your end. And He, as long as you stay close to Him, you will have a good end. So stay, stay close to Him, my friend. Well, I hope you got something out of this video today. If you did, I just want to remind you again to consider becoming a subscriber to our channel. Also, uh, if you're getting benefit from the content, please like and share this video with anybody that you think it will help. Also, if you'd like to contribute financially uh, to our ministry, please see the links below. Well, I really enjoyed our session of daily renewal today, but until next time, God bless you and have a great day.